Is it fair or ethical for food companies to target low-income communities with marketing for unhealthy foods? How do disparities reveal themselves in what people eat and how diet affects their health? These are important and complex questions that we will explore today with Dr. Shariki Kumanika. I'm Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and Professor of Public Policy at Duke. Shariki is Research Professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention at the Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University in Philadelphia and also Professor Emerita of Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine where she served on the faculty for many years. Shariki looks at social equity problems from unique perspectives. Her research focuses on the prevention and management of obesity and diet related diseases and on solutions to social disparities. She holds degrees in human nutrition, public health, and social work. Shariki is the founder and chair of the Council on Black Health, formerly known as the African American Collaborative Obesity Research Network, which develops and promotes solutions that achieve healthy black communities. She also serves as a nutrition advisor to the World Health Organization. And in my mind, there's probably nobody better in the world to help address these issues of disparities. And Shariki, you've long led this, this world of people interested in health disparities, nutrition disparities, and what they mean in the lives of individuals. So it's a real pleasure to have you join us today. Yes, glad to participate. <laughs> so, Shariki, you've been a hero for addressing diet, weight, and health-related issues in the context of disparities and inequality. These are very important issues. Can you explain why these issues are so important and what some of the, the key matters are that we should be considering going forward? Uh, sure. Um, well, obesity is, um, I think, has taken uh, societies globally by surprise in that it used to be considered such a you know, problem of a few people who couldn't control what they eat or something like that. That was the perception. And now it's really become a major societal problem um, in U.S., similar countries, but also in places like the Middle East and uh, low- and middle-income countries, and even in Africa, which uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which didn't didn't have uh, a high prevalence of obesity before, but it's been going up. And my interest in the inequality issues has been related to a phenomenon of higher obesity prevalence in populations that are um, socially disadvantaged, uh, particularly racial and ethnic minority populations in um, in the U.S. and in some other countries like the U.K. and, and some European countries. And I think one of the reasons that it, it's, it's so important is that um, the way we're approaching the epidemic now, which, is, which relates to societal changes and really looking at the environments that lead to uh, people's inability to control their weight at, at the population level, not just a few individuals, uh, it's, that's going to be especially important because the, the circumstances that sort of promote high obesity prevalence are more common in the population groups that, uh, that have more obesity and that are socially disadvantaged. And so I think that although it used to be thought that, um, let's say, American Indians or black Americans or black women were were in the group of, of that were somehow just defective or un unable to control, control weight. Now that the epidemic has reached children and adults in the population at large, we're getting attention to some of these issues. And so the challenge is to make sure that the attention that we're getting on these issues reaches the communities who have the most, you know, most of the problem. So, Shriki, what are uh, some examples of things that might be done to accomplish that goal? Well, um, I think I'll refer to a, to something that was just published earlier this this week. Um, some of the things that are being done are the the policies and and systems changes that you know well. I mean, that we've been talked talking about um, ever since I think you <laughs> coined the term the toxic environment. Uh, really changing uh, things in the food system, changing where people get food and, and how things are, are promoted and what, what foods are given to children in school meals as much as we can on the food side, and then also changing things about physical activity, things that affect uh, how many calories people uh, 
um, are expending every day so that um, there's a calorie balance and, and people are able to maintain their weight. So the, the things that people have seen, like menu labeling, to help people understand how many calories are in their food, and, and some of the guidelines for um, what kinds of foods are allowed for people who are being um, uh, participants in the WIC program. And that one is particularly targeted to um, low-income w- women and, and their children. And then there's a lot of discussion about changes to the SNAP, you know, or what used to be called the food stamp program, because that is a source of, of income for people to buy foods. And there, there's been a lot of policy discussion about whether there should be some way of m- making it um, more likely that people will be using those resources for healthier foods. Shriki, one thing that I think it would be interesting to get your thoughts on is that, that many people think that obesity and then food insecurity or what used to be called malnutrition or are opposite sides of the coin, but in fact, they can coexist and there can be a common set of social drivers and certain groups can be especially vulnerable to both. Can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, Yes, I think that... um those things are coming together more and more, again, both in, in the U.S. And, and, and globally, because, uh, as it turns out, the foods that are easiest to afford for people with very low incomes and maybe even sporadic incomes um, are also the ones that are highest in, you know, the, the sort of ultra-processed foods that are high in calories and fat, and the resources to actually use those foods well in terms of, you know, cooking facilities and, you know, a stable home life are also less likely to occur in some of the populations that are at high risk. So this, the same aspects of the food system have have effects on both people with limited food choices and also for people who uh, don't have those limits but are sort of bombarded with marketing of unhealthy foods. Um, and, and I think I, I wanted to, to add, when you were asking what could be done about this, and I referred to this, this work from the Healthy Community Study that was published this week, is that these are some of the things that we think can be done, including getting food pantries, for example, where people with food insecurity might go to have, have uh, healthier foods. These things don't seem to be working as well as we thought maybe five, six years ago. So that's a concern, and that's why I mentioned we have to make sure that these things, when we do them, are getting to the people who need them the most, because the Healthy Community Study data, this is a large study in 130 communities just just documenting what types of things people are doing with some of these policies and changes. And the findings of this study, from three or four of the different main results papers show that these things were working best. It was focused on child obesity, uh, working most clearly in the Northeast and in high income and white communities. And they're not really reaching the other communities and the communities in, in greatest need. Shariki, one of the things that you just mentioned that I find especially fascinating is your work on targeted marketing. Can you explain what this concept is and why it's important? Uh, yes, this is target marketing has become a preoccupation of mine. I think recently I find myself talking about it more and more and trying to convince public health, public health professionals and researchers to pay more attention to it. So to try to give a quick uh, summary of what target marketing is, uh, it's It's the common business practice of trying to identify groups in the population or segments that are most likely to to want and buy your product, and then making sure that the marketing is um, addressed to those groups. Uh, When I say target marketing, so that's a general practice in, in, in marketing and, and, and it's not just food advertising, although that's what comes to mind. Mostly it's also, you know, where you know, where the stores are, but then in this in the in the store what kind of products are thought to appeal to the population shopping there and how they might be positioned and so forth. And I've been interested in it because one of the ways that marketers can identify a segment is with their demographic characteristics and so race and gender and age are used freely as a uh, a segmentation a strategy and unfortunately it's it's extremely easy to document that food products that are less healthy and beverages products that are that are less healthy are more heavily marketed to um, the same communities and the same populations that happen to have high rates of obesity and some of the obesity related diseases so that's the targeting 
uh, that I've been interested in and, and trying to sort out what to do about that targeting because I think it's really a, a barrier to the effectiveness of any efforts we have in trying to improve um, the food circumstances and diets of, of the high-risk populations. So, Shariki, is the, uh, the increment in marketing to some disadvantaged populations a little bit, a lot? Is it, I mean, put, put it in context for us, if you would. Um, Sometimes, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's a lot. Um, it, it's partly a lot because there are several aspects of marketing that work together in targeting a particular community. So let's say a uh, common finding is that a certain type of ad um, for, say, a sugar-sweetened beverage or a particular type of snack food or, or breakfast cereal may be twice as likely, a TV ad, say, twice as likely to be seen by a black child, um, you know, based on the Nielsen viewing um, data, than a white child. So you have that, but then you also have in the geographical area where that child lives, uh, targeting in the form of the types of products that are available, uh, sometimes products priced really to, um, to be extremely affordable so that a healthier option couldn't compete. And then there are these other aspects of marketing like special websites and sponsorships. So a lot of the same companies that heavily market products that, you know, don't have a good nutrient profile to black communities, for example, are also the same companies that would appear to have the interests of these communities at heart because they pour a lot of money into the communities in terms of educational programs and sponsorships. So it, it really then creates a loyalty and a sense that you know these companies are for us, and when their products and their brands appear, the the and, and appear more often, you know it's like a perfect storm. Shriki, the um, this targeted marketing is such an interesting topic, and before I've heard you talk about that, there's an interesting social history to some of this, where there was a time when the the, the communities that now might be targeted were actually interested in having more marketing directed at them. Could you explain how, how that worked? Um, sure. Well, so back in the days when things were segregated and, and um, it was common to think of Negroes, for example, as a different kind of people, you know, and, and not the same, um, you know, not necessarily good customers. Uh, some companies discovered that there was a lot of money in say, the black community in the Negro market and began to market specifically their products with, um, I mean, the one video, I think, it's one of the beverage companies that you see that these, these proud um, salesmen, black salesmen, who couldn't even sleep in a hotel in the South because everything was segregated, but they were so proud to be salesmen and out there selling products. And so it's it's kind of, it's like a, a civil rights or a recognition issue of being valued in the marketplace and being seen. And I experienced that even as a child, that I didn't see products that had pictures on them that looked like me, or if I did, they were, they were not necessarily uh, appealing pictures. And so it was a long time before the, the market has really began to say, you know, these, these are customers. Um, uh, and we can, you know, if we appeal to these customers, you know, we can, we can make money with them. So that's, that's kind of what it is. It's a, it's a mixed blessing in that sense, um, because not all of the products that are perceived to be, I guess most of the products that are perceived to be the best to sell are, are the less healthy products. What are some of the thoughts you have about possible solutions to the target of marketing problem? Um, I actually am having some new thoughts about this, uh, partly referring back to an article from 1996. You know, it's funny because people say, well, don't cite anything that's more than five years old, but there's a lot of good stuff in things that were written, you know, back, you know, decades ago that haven't really been implemented. And, um, you know, this is also a problem in tobacco and alcohol marketing. And an early paper uh, in this field, 1996, by uh, Jerome Williams and some of his colleagues, uh, Jerome is a marketing researcher, uh, asked the question of, is this good business or is it racism? You know, are people really being 
um, preyed upon by marketers, or is this just a coincidence of the fact that they're looking for a segment that will use products? And they focused on blacks and Hispanics and, and um, alcohol and tobacco marketing. And in that article, they, they offer a framework for thinking through um, what to do about target marketing. And, and my thoughts have really turned more to, to looking at targeting because there are, more, there are more populations than just minority groups. I mean, targeting to women, you know, tobacco, things have, you know, targeted to women to, to raise their smoking rates and so forth. Um, and targeting to children in the food area has been a big issue, as well as targeting of other types of products that might be considered harmful. So I've been thinking that what we've been spending our time on, we being public health researchers, is documenting the fact that this targeting of harmful products exists. And we haven't been connecting the dots in terms of, does this marketing really cause harm? And because, you know, probably it seems so obvious that, you know, you would show that it exists and people get shock value. I mean, you know, I mentioned the two to one ratio, but sometimes the ratio of ads seen or um, other things related to target marketing is much higher than that with the ads culturally tailored to have, you know, the greatest salience. So you see this and you think, wow. And then, so what can we do about this? And you come up empty. So I'm, I'm thinking that a more refined research agenda that really asks in an open-minded way, what is the harm coming from this? And, and in this, this article that I mentioned, um, to separate the effect of the marketing from the intent of the marketing. Because um, if you say, well, this is just good marketing, these companies don't mean to harm, and look at all the good they're doing for communities, that's not the right question anymore as I'm thinking about it now. It's really more, is the effect of this marketing disproportionate in terms of, um, say, the how much the particular population group was using the product before? Are you actually raising the level of use of a harmful product? Uh, and what is the overall harm? And what's the, what's the moral compass in marketing that one can find around the issue of harm? And, and then, you know, really work on that and connect the dots with the research to show where the harm is occurring and approach it that way. And that, maybe there has been some work like that, but I, I've seen a lot of documentation. I haven't seen as much of this um, type of argument. And I think it's better to, con to include all types of target marketing of healthy products, all audiences, so it doesn't put a stigma on minority groups, for example, or, or low-income populations, as if they somehow need special protection from marketers, and, and which is a kind of a paternalistic derogatory uh, impression. So, Shriki, you were saying that the health impacts or, or the, the use of the product needs to be documented in these groups, but can't you just assume that it's having a negative impact? I mean, the, why would the, would the companies be spending all the money marketing if it weren't driving up use of these products? And if, if, if consumption of certain categories of things like sugar-sweetened beverages has been shown to have negative health impacts, then the two-to-one ratio you mentioned of minority to non-minority populations receiving exposure to this marketing is occurring. Can't you just assume it's bad and set about trying to do something about it? Yeah, I think that from a public health perspective, um, you could assume that. But in the society we're living in, there are some things that, uh, a lot of things that trump a public health perspective. And in a free market mode and with the uh, profit motive and the amount of money you know, that's involved with the food as a big business, you have to make the case. And so I think that's what I'm saying. I don't think we've been willing to have to prove the case because it's such an obvious connection. Um, but some of the things that were suggested when I was, when I've been thinking about this, looking for new, new pathways to, to um, pursue, were that a lot of our um, efforts to do this are still pretty blunt instruments. They're not brand specific. They're not necessarily segment specific in a way that would... Um, really give us the kind of uh, evidence that we need. And I think policymakers, if they're going to be any, any um, 
policies put in place, uh, it's going to be really tough. I mean, it, um, I think you know that the efforts before of trying to do something about marketing and put curbs on marketing have, you know, they've all failed, um, you know, crashed and burned. But I, I'm so convinced that something has to be done to shift these patterns of marketing if we're ever going to be successful in general and in high-risk populations. Um, in, in improving diets of, of the population, that we have to do something and we need a new type of evidence that will influence policymakers and compete with the type of evidence that they'll get about um, why, it's a, why this type of marketing is a good idea and that kind of stuff. Well, thank you for that. So one final question. Do you see anything that you would consider particularly shining spots in the nation's um, effort to address obesity? Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a weird answer, Shariki type answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that the shining spot is that we have been trying very hard to implement what we thought would work and are now possibly at a new inflection point. There's more consideration being given to community engagement. There's more consideration being given to broader social determinants and not thinking that our interventions are operating alone, but that, you know, the food system is connected to social care systems and economic systems and, you know, physical activity is connected to transportation systems. So I think that this this movement toward a system approach and toward more community engagement rather than um, formulating our solutions and sort of laying on hands and expecting them to work, I think that's really a bright spot because I think the answers to a population-wide problem like this are in the communities that are actually being affected and know what their lives are like and can co-create some of the solutions that will then push back against the forces that are driving the epidemic. Well, Shriki, it's nice to end on an optimistic note and to hear your thoughts on where you see things going. So thank you so much for joining us. Yes, I'm, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Please subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or iTunes, or by visiting our website at the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.